Well, welcome everyone to this conversation about the future of food. Uh, we are very fortunate today to have with us Betsy McLaughlin and Jack Hitt to discuss this topic. Um, they bring different perspectives, different backgrounds, but I think we're going to find it uh, quite a stimulating conversation. Um, from, let me tell you first about Betsy McLaughlin. From 2003 to 2011, Betsy served as CEO of the clothing retailer Hot Topic. And uh, Betsy, um, at least one of my children was a member of Hot Topic's target audience. So I can assure you I spent uh, many happy hours and some money in that very stimulating environment. Uh, during Betsy's tenure as CEO, the corporation was included in the Forbes list of 200 hot companies, Fortune's 100's fastest growing companies, Bloomberg's hot growth companies, and, and I think this is an interesting compliment, Fortune's 100 best companies to work for. And among other accolades, Betsy was named by Institutional Investor as one of the best CEOs in America. Um, she's received a number of awards for her think outside the box approach to management, specifically the recruiting and training of primarily younger workers um, in brick and mortar locations. And we're particularly fortunate to have Betsy's perspective for this topic today because she has also um, a extensive service on boards of directors for restaurants and food retailers, including Pinkberry, Noodles and & Company, and Veggie Grill. And she also consults on branding, marketing, leadership, and organizational development uh, for firms in the consumer sector. So Betsy, welcome. Um, we're thrilled to have you. Our other conversation partner is Jack Hitt. He's a prolific and widely published writer a contributing editor to Harper's, New York Times Magazine, and This American Life. In 2006, Jack earned a Peabody Award for a segment of This American Life focused on prisoners in Guantanamo Bay, which is entitled Habeas Schmabius. Um, in 2017, he co-hosted the Peabody Award-winning Gimlet Media podcast, Uncivil, along with Chinjirai Kumanika. And among Jack's wide ranging work, he has written about food, including a piece about the Bessinger brothers in South Carolina, whose divergent politics and competing barbecue restaurants um, really caused barbecue to become a symbol and a place of contestation for a host of cultural conflicts, including disputes over the Confederate flag. And some of Jack's recent and forthcoming work, I think, demonstrates the breadth of his observations and his vision. Yesterday, Wired Magazine published his article about citizen patriots and digital nerds taking unusual action to preserve voting lists in a time of voter suppression. And next month in the Virginia Quarterly Review, Jack's going to publish an essay about the ways uh, public statues promote revisionist history. Finally, um, Jack's at work right now on a new American history podcast, which he describes as quite different from Uncivil, that will tell stories about America's underground history. Jack, we're delighted to have you. Great. I want to thank both of you for joining us for this conversation about the future of food. So to get us started thinking about this topic, I wondered if each of you uh, could Tell us about the best meal you've had outside your home lately. Like, where was it? When was it? What did you eat? Uh, because this is such an unusual time uh, to be thinking about food. Betsy, you want to get us started? Sure. Well, um, I have to twist the question a bit because I have not been out of my house for a meal since <laughs> March the 13th. I live in Los Angeles, and if any of you have seen the LA numbers, uh, they're not good. And I live in Manhattan Beach, which is a small community, a uh, lot of traffic, a lot of tourism, uh, certainly a lot of domestic tourism this year. And so I have not felt safe, and I have friends who are restaurant chefs, uh, fine dining chefs, casual dining chefs, and they've all told me to stay in. So um, I have not gone out, but I will tell you, there is a restaurant in town, so I'm gonna talk about my, my, my favorite in 
house uh, meal I've had. There is a restaurant in town by the name of Vespertine. It's constantly rated the number one uh, restaurant in Los Angeles. Has a very avant-garde chef with a building that was, was made for him. And he serves a 12 course dinner. Most people can't get in. Uh, very expensive, the, kind of the old fine dining um, format, but in a very modern way. And of course, when COVID hit, he had to shut down. And he shut down, he went dark for about four months. And a month ago, he decided to do an homage to his grandmother's Oaxacan cooking. And he did a 12 course meal, which you could go pick up. And I thought, well, what the heck? He's a great chef. It's not, it's not fine dining, but I'm sure he'll have an interesting take on what it means to dine in home. And you, you drive in and it gets delivered to your car and you come home and the first thing you have is an envelope and inside of it is a barcode and you scan the barcode and up comes the most beautiful uh, guide for the meal. There's music. There are pictures, there's background on all of the farmers, and he talks about how he never gets to appreciate the farmers as much as he can when he's doing in-dining restaurant, and flowers to go on the table. Uh, and as you go through the meal, it tells you how to warm it, how to, how to present it, everything is in the, in the package. And I will say it will go down as probably one of the best meals I've ever eaten, one of the best experiences partially because it was so unexpected. And secondly, for a chef to actually break out of that box of I'm going to put the food together, put it in a cardboard box and send it home with you and then you can do with it what you want. Um, just, just was absolutely amazing. Fast forward to today, you can't, you can't get takeout from him anymore because the line is so long, the, the wait list is so long, you can't get in. But um, really, really remarkable. That's a, yeah. What a great example. Jack. I find that a lot of, uh, it seems like the default mode now in this time of adapting to eating out is, is, uh, is like beach food. You know, like the place where, the place where you could go pick up a lobster roll uh, right up the road from me, but they're doing great. You know, uh, you know, all these places where it was a little bit more uh, kind of casual, less uh, fine dining, you know, sit down tablecloths, all that inside. Um, so my favorite joint is the stack here in New Haven, which is very much outdoors. I mean, it's practically half a football field of a, of a, of a space next to the restaurant. Um, and, and, and because it's, you know, it's barbecue, but not only pork and, and brisket, but, you know, uh, chicken and, and uh, everything else. And then this insane array of vegetables. So you really, you can kind of like, like I said, it's, it's, it, it reminds me of the old days of, I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, of eating at the beach where it was very much just sort of like walk up in your flip flops and, uh, and grab your, you know, your stuff and head out. Um, at least that seems to be the first, uh, you know, effort at trying to figure out how to eat out in the days of the pandemic. Um, so I'd say I'd have some, my favorite meals have been there. Also, they let you bring your dog. So, and that's one of the nice things about eating out is now you can, it's just, it just seems far more casual than it ever was six months ago, all eating, you know? Um, I will say I went out to a place because they allowed you to sit on the roof uh, a couple of weeks ago with my wife and the the food was absolutely uh, C minus maybe, you know, not that great. Uh, you know, they, they made that classic mistake of giving you lots of mediocre food. So the, you know, the rice came out, it was, you know, the, a pile the size of your head. Uh, but uh, it, it was so mediocre. And I, you, normally you just walk off from a, a moment like that. But this time I was enraged. You know, I was like, wait a minute, this is my one time out the whole, you know, in 10 days. And I, and I get a bad meal. So I, I think the pressure's on uh, now for everything from the, the, the seashore lobster shack to, uh, to any restaurant, you know, in any downtown to like really, to really put out some, some good food. Because for most of us now, it, it's, it's always a special night out, right? So, so Jack, this, this comment sort of suggests to us something about um, diner expectations when they right. go out. But I also want to, um, you know, think about the extent to which those expectations when you go out are also fueled by people's rediscovery of how good the food can be when they make it at home now. And so I wondered if the two of you could talk a little bit about cooking at home 
maybe a favorite recipe if you have one, but just what this pandemic has done to people's experience of cooking at home, what they're discovering, what they're enhancing, et cetera. How about you, Jack? You want to start with that? Okay. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll just want to ask Betsy, like what I, it's, it's interesting to see like what, what, what you've observed among your friends, you know, like what, what all has happened. Um, and I, I, I do know some much younger people who have just discovered like the, the, the basic uh, pleasure of roasting vegetables because uh, it's just so simple, you know, or another thing that I, uh, that I've, uh, I, I'm encouraging everyone to, to learn to do is, um, you know, if you have a, any good fresh vegetable, uh, cauliflower, broccoli, green beans, just put two tablespoons of uh, salt. That's a lot of salt, but yes, a lot of salt in, you know, half a pot of water and just boil them for a few minutes. It, it salts it from the inside um, it, it, and it's not over salted. It's unbelievable. Everybody who discovers this is like, wait, what? It's so easy. So I wonder if vegetables aren't, uh, vegetables just in general aren't uh, experiencing a bit of a renaissance. I do know because I've talked to my fishmonger. Yes, I don't often get to use that word, happy to. Um, my fishmonger who tells me that people are lining up to buy seafood. You know, they're just, um, that's the one thing people want at home uh, or, or are willing to sort of try to learn how to cook, you know? So, you know, shrimp and crab, you know, whole fish, et cetera. You know, it's, um, people are, are, are discovering that again. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if that's keeping people out of the, you know, the, the high cholesterol, you know, sort of red meat worlds, um, fantastic. I mean, maybe there is some kind of health change too, to the way, way people are eating. I don't know. Betsy, what are you seeing? You know, I, I will say the same thing. I mean, I, I, I was, I think, a pretty decent cook before this started. And I'm a, pr I'm a really good cook now, um, partially because <laughs> I've tried new things. And it's not like you have, you know, there's time now. And mm -hmm. so it's okay if I mess something up and do it again. I'm not just cooking because I'm entertaining or I'm cooking because it's, it's a special meal. Mm -hmm. So it's been fantastic to actually allow myself to mess up in the kitchen and perfect something. But right. I am hearing the exact same thing. Um, I had fishmonger on my sheet of paper too, which is hilarious because I never get to use that either. I'm glad I got in there for uh, Yeah, I know, exactly. It's foodies, fishmongers. <laughs> um, but my, my fish dude, he told me um, also that they just can't keep the fish in stock. And it's interesting because um, a lot of people at Hot Topic, we had about 10,000 employees and a lot of them still stay in touch with me via Facebook and Instagram and they see my posts of food. And uh, I've gotten a lot of requests over the past four months of, can you give me a simple dish to prepare? Um, and they, they really come in two forms. One are fish because so many are shifting and we can talk about this a little bit later about trends, but the, the, the shift from meat into fish and it seems like this is the time that people want to do it. Fish is very expensive right now too. So I think um, that's, that's also been interesting. And I think a lot of young people uh, don't know how to make fish, even though it's super simple to do. So uh, that's been one path of lots of requests on how to make fish or different recipes for fish. And the second are very cultural dishes. They're used to going to their favorite Thai restaurant that closed down, their favorite Ethiopian restaurant that just closed down, their favorite Oaxacan restaurant that just closed down. And they just want one or two comfort dishes um, that use ingredients that they're not even familiar with, don't know where to get them, and don't know how hard, hard the meal is. So I found, have found that very, very interesting. Um, but I would tell you my big claim to fame, which I'm so excited about, which anyone can do, is King Arthur, King Arthur Mixed Flour fairly good flour for home use. I've never been a baker. I'm not a sugar eater and I've never been a baker. Mark Bittman, if I ever find him on the street, I'm going to inappropriately hug him for his no need bread recipe that started me on this path. But I will tell you, King Arthur has a recipe on their website called Crispy Cheesy Pan Pizza. If you do the Google search for King Arthur Crispy Cheesy Pan Pizza, you will get it. And it is the most, the easiest, most fantastic pizza. Um, and I have given that recipe out probably a hundred times in the past five months. So that's my favorite for personally that I've discovered. I've, I'm eating a lot more pizza these days from friends because that's a class, that's a brilliant uh, COVID solution, yeah. right? He cooks the pizza, puts it on the tray, cuts it up and the, and then everybody can walk up and grab their own, uh, you know, slice. Um, 
I, I have pulled off an eight person dinner party, which was uh, really, um, I thought you know, it took a lot of planning, but you know, an enormous table outside with, you know, two people at each corner. Um, everything was separate, you know, and then, um, and then, you know, cook vegetables and maybe said shrimp on the grill, um, something really simple. And, and then I'm the only person moving back and forth. It, it totally works. It totally works. But it is, it is, um, it is amazing how we have to kind of rethink every step of cooking and, and how much that's become a part of like my daily planning, uh, is just figuring out my food. You know, yeah, I, I think more you, consciously about food than I ever have. I, that, I would, that's what I was going to say, Jack, is that I have spent more time thinking about when to go to the grocery store, how to navigate the grocery store, which grocery stores to go to based on what I think they're out of, how do I get to a farmer's market, how do I prepare, what meal am I preparing for, what's my next meal while I'm preparing the current meal. I mean, I really, food has really sort of taken over a good portion of my daily routine. Right. Same. Yeah. And and, you know, some people, you know, I think, when they hear, go ahead. oh, well, I was going to say when they, I think some people, when they hear Betsy talk about that list of issues that she has to, to think through, might say, mm -hmm. wow, that sounds stressful. But can you guys talk, a, I don't know, a little bit about the actual pleasure of making food a bit more of the, the focus of your thoughts or, or being more conscious or mindful? of food. What are the benefits of that for people? Well, I can, I can throw out one thing because I'm married to a doctor who uh, wrote a book about food uh, a long time ago. So this is not from my writing, but I'm just cribbing my wife's stuff. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, most of us don't think uh, consciously about food most of the day. We just grab it. And th this being America, food is everywhere. So no one really eats three meals a day. We're, we're kind of grazers in America. We're eating constantly from the moment we get up until the moment we go to sleep, just because food is everywhere. It's, it's just in every meeting. It's just sitting on a table somewhere. And of course, if you're working out of your house, it's just around, right? And, and one of the techniques of trying to get people to uh, lose weight or, or create a more fit diet is to just be more aware of what you're eating. And so, you know, there's all these, uh, you know, tricks of like, keep a food diary. Um, you'd be surprised if you do keep a food diary, it turns out you lie to yourself most of the time um, <laughs> about what you eat and don't eat. You know, you think you don't eat uh, a lot more than you do eat, you know. Um, but I, I wonder now, you know, and I was guilty of that like anybody. I just ate kind of like whatever was coming down the pike, you know. And now, you know, like Betsy was saying, um, it's far more deliberated. I have to go buy these ingredients. You have to make a list. You don't want to go to a store twice a day or, you know, every other day even. You want to make sure that, you know, you, you make, because that visit is so stressful and so fraught, um, you want to time it, you know, have your full list and, and, and be ready. So I, I think we've, we are all much more mindful. And I, I challenge to find, I want to find out if we're really all gaining like 15 or 20 pounds during the pandemic. I wonder if it's not the other way around. It may balance out over time. Betsy, did you have thoughts about this whole issue of the mindfulness of eating? Well, you know, I was, I'm an aesthetic person, a creative person. And so I've always been enamored with the colors of produce and food and tactically how it feels and, and you know presentation and i'm one of those people that used to just wander farmers markets for the heck of it got a few hours i don't go to the movies i go wander the farmers market um just because i think it's fun so to me it's um it, this is this is great fun for me i will say i've never had to do menu planning before so I was much more likely to go see what was fresh and then in my mind develop a recipe around it, go home, start it. As Jack said, go back out to the store again, whatever my pantry didn't have, I could, I could you know, supplement. I don't wanna do that anymore. So I actually spend time sitting down and thinking about what are the meals going to be for the rest of the week and it's no longer just dinner. Um, you know, you can, lunch, breakfast is easy, but now, you know, what, are, what am I having for lunch? What am I having for dinner? Is there anybody coming over? Do I have to be anywhere? And so, um, I, I find it enjoyable, um, until it's not, until I have a busy week and all of a sudden I don't have time 
to worry about when I'm going to get to the grocery store when it's not crowded. So I have, you know, both sides of the coin a bit as we've moved through this. I think things are settling down a little bit more now. Plus, it's heirloom tomato season, so I can make anything out of heirloom tomatoes. So August is going to be a good month. But I would say I've just had to spend more time on the planning side. Um, I, this is a good time for me to jump in and say, if people have questions, don't forget the chat box or the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. That's a place you can put in questions and Betsy and Jack will be happy to field them. A question has come in that sort of uh, jumps us into sort of thinking about trends, Betsy. Uh, you had mentioned that earlier. Of course, one of the trends that's been taking off are, are the sort of prepared, the box meals, the, the things that are shipped to you from, you know, Sun Basket, Blue Apron, Home Chef. I guess two questions. Can you talk about that trend in general? And then I'm also really interested to hear from the two of you if you've had experience with those and what the experience has been like to, to receive this sort of prepackaged um, meal that you get to prepare in your home. Well, you know, I'll start just by talking about what's just happened in general with consumer choices. And, you know, we're def we've definitely seen a shift in choices. We've seen customer expectations rise because of it. But, you know, it started when, when and I'll talk from the restaurant perspective, because I'm on restaurant boards and as a consumer, most of my interaction on the business side is with restaurants. You know, it started when COVID um, first happened that restaurants had to shut down and in order to preserve any kinds of jobs, they needed to do something. And so they offered pantry items for sale. And, you know, they couldn't do meals, but they had all this flour and eggs and sugar and yeast that they wanted to support their farmers and their, and their vendors. And so you could hear, certainly in LA, and I know in New York, you could go in and you could buy restaurant quality products, which perhaps you haven't had the chance to buy before. And I would tell you, if you've ever had yeast that is, has, has fresh yeast or baker's yeast or flour that's been milled just two weeks ago, it's a game changer. I mean, us mere mortals never get to try ingredients like that unless you know a chef. And so I think as time has gone on, you've seen family meals, which, you know, is, has added a layer on because restaurants decided, hey, listen, people want to eat as families. They're looking for meals for four to six people. And so you're getting these family meals from fine dining and casual dining restaurants that a three course meal for six people is $80. So, so you're holding that up against the subscription side of the business, which is fairly expensive actually on subscription meals. But now you can get a restaurant that will give you this incredible meal completely done. You don't even have to cook it for $80. And then they decided that cocktails, we could do cocktails now. So now you can get go to cocktails. So here you are. You're in your COVID, in your COVID bubble, three o'clock cocktail hour, and maybe it's two o'clock now, started at five o'clock and it's gradually worked its way back. But now you can get your to-go cocktails at three o'clock. You can have a family meal at six o'clock for dinner with your family. And then if you're lucky enough to have gotten on and bought a board game or a puzzle before they were all sold out, you can actually have board games and puzzles with your family. When do you schedule the brawl? And the brawl, yeah, the brawl is somewhere, there's, there's, there's somewhere in there. So, <laughs> if so you're I drinking think, it too, there's going to be a brawl at seven. <laughs> so I think, you know, when you talk about choices, there's, it, it used to be you cooked at home, you went out and dined at a restaurant, or the subscription meal business really came into play because you wanted something in the middle. You wanted somebody to do a bit of the work for you curate what you were going to eat and then make it simple to prepare but it was still that the reason you were doing it is because you wanted to prepare at home and you mm. wanted somebody else to do some of that work now all of a sudden you they've got competition like they've never had before and so um i i think what has happened with subscription is as humans do when restaurants first shut down subscription saw a spike because all of a sudden you're at home, you don't know what to do, you haven't learned to cook, you don't know what the world is like, we couldn't go to grocery stores really, farmers markets weren't open. So if you, if you were interested in cooking yourself, that was a really good option. I think as time has gone by, there are so many other options for how you can prepare a meal at home or how you can have a meal feel like you prepared it at home but brought in from a restaurant that it's, it's, you know, for, for a consumer, it's fantastic. 
Um, the expectations have definitely increased though, because as we move past COVID, my expectation is going to be that all of those options are still available to me. Hmm. I don't know. I've never done the uh, the subscription meal, um, but I I, I wonder um, how how this change in the way we cook food is, affects uh, sort of the, the the gendered issues regarding food. Like I, when I, I grew up, men cooked uh, where I came from. Uh, not not so much uh, like you know breakfast and and lunch, but definitely cooked. You know, cooked up you know whole pigs or you know engaged in oyster roast. I guess I guess if there were more than ten people coming over to dinner, then somehow a guy would get involved. But I have noticed um, most recently that um, uh, some of my male friends have really amped up their uh, cooking participation. If anything, they've probably taken it over, bought a stupid toque. And uh, are running around the house now, considering themselves David Chang or something. But, but they they um, I, I I do feel like um, men in particular are are making a discovery that the kitchen is a really cool place and and maybe a place they shouldn't have avoided all these years. I don't know, Betsy. Is there any evidence to that? Um, well, I think I think if you're home more, you cook more. And I think whether you're a working female or whether you're a working male, if you're at home all of a sudden and you, you know, are used to eating at a certain level, mm -hmm. you know, spending time in the kitchen and cooking just becomes part of, of what you're doing because you're not going to, you're not going to do fast food. And if you have a family, this is the other thing too, is kids, kids expectations have increased immensely. The number of friends that I have, where the kids are now participants in deciding which family meal from which restaurant they're going to eat or what they want for dinner. There's, yeah. just, there's conversations about it because everybody's you know, in four walls. And so now everyone has a vote. Um, much like you know, dogs are now part of what activities do you do, whether it's going out to eat or whether it's taking a hike, you take into consideration the dog part of your family. I think on the food side of it, you definitely take into consideration everybody. So I think, I think both parents, or you know, male or female, I think I think think everybody has upped their game if they're interested in, you know, supplementing restaurant food with home food. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to get some um, really interesting questions coming in. Um, I want to circle back to one question uh, that that sort of arises from this reference to suddenly having access to really fresh ingredients and really special ingredients. What about the flip side of that? What are we observing about the pandemic's creation of certain shortages of ingredients? Are there things that people are having a harder time getting access to now? And um, does either of you know a you know kind of a workaround for an ingredient that's hard to get hold of? I guess I heard at one point it was really hard to buy yeast because all of a sudden everybody wanted to make bread. Um, are, are there other examples that you've heard about? Sure well, of course, with that, I heard about flour, and uh, and a lot of people had trouble getting flour, uh, wheat flour in particular. And I remember I was, I was at a store, and they had you know eight bags of wheat flour, and I called my friends who had complained about the wheat flour. I was like, I'm in this joint. There is wheat flour. How much do you want? You know, it was like I felt like I was you know an under you know World War II underground or something. I was uh, smuggling out you know as many bags of wheat flour as I could from this joint. But I don't know, I think it's kind of settled down now. I think people have figured out, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, Betsy, are, are there other ingredients that are, that are in short supply now? It seems like, it's sort of like the toilet paper thing. You know, in that first 10 days, you know, every, <laughs> everybody in America for some reason uh, ran off to buy toilet paper. And by the way, I don't know if you caught this, but there were several articles about how in Spain, they were they were all running off to get olive oil in Greece, it was feta cheese. And in England, it was like, I can't remember. It was uh, God. What was it? But but only in America was it toilet paper. Yeah, everywhere else it was food. <laughs> I don't know what that says about us. It's probably not good. You know, I think <laughs> that's all settled down now. Yeah, I think a lot of it has settled down. I think certainly. I mean, I think um, depending on your socioeconomic status, you had different mm -hmm. things that were missing. I think um, I call them. You know white rich white people problems when I can't get my yeast and I can't get my organic sugar and I can't get my you know organic free range eggs because I've decided that I'm going to bake and how awful that is to not be able to have those ingredients 
and then you just hit yourself in the head and said and say what about those people who are on the snap program who can't even order online and don't have farmers markets and go to a store and and it's it's they're out of a lot of things um because they can't buy in bulk and they don't have the money to buy in bulk and and so here they are trying to figure out how do they just get enough to be able to feed their family. Um, so I think there's been, there's been a lot of shortages in many of the underserved communities um, that are more basic needs. Mm -hmm. Not being able to have milk, not having fresh bread. Um, and, and I don't know that that has changed much in five months. I think in, the, in, in middle class communities, yes, you can get sugar now, you can get rice now. But in the areas where food insecurity is really an issue and where um, there's a lot of service workers who are outside the home, not inside the home, and actually have less time now to be able to prepare anything inside the home. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why if you look at in, in, in restaurants, you know, fast food has not had a problem. We call them QSR. They've had drive throughs all along. It's, just, it's cheap food. It's not healthy food but um, it's, it's accessible and it's COVID friendly in that you don't have to go in anywhere. And so I think, you know, there's, there's some interesting things happening as you look at different, you know, levels of society economics. Uh, Betsy, let's, let's pick up on that and, and just talk a little bit about what you're seeing uh, for trends in the restaurant industry. Um, you, you mentioned that the, fast food, faster food is, is doing okay. What other trends are we observing? And then what's the forecast? I mean, it, it, is this uh, crisis going to cause some restaurants just to kind of go away for a while? Are we going to see a major shakeup in the industry? Well, it's already happened. Uh, over 60% of restaurants that have shuttered are out of business for good. Um, they're not coming back. And a lot of those are the, the, the mom and pop restaurants, um, those that perhaps were, were not able to invest in technology and delivery. You know, before I, maybe, maybe best to talk a little bit about what the restaurant model has been. Um, you know, delivery entered the scene uh, five years ago, six years ago in a big way. And for those of you who don't know, delivery is incredibly expensive to restaurants. So a DoorDash, a Caviar, um, a Postmates, uh, Uber Eats, restaurants pay between five and 15% for the delivery. And restaurant models did not have that room to begin with. 70% um, of a restaurant's um, uh, uh, expenses are on labor, in labor, back of house. And so you've already got 70% back of house, you've got the front of house, you've got your rent, um, and so most restaurants, it's not a profitable model, whether you're a fine dining restaurant, we always hear fine dining. I'm sure Jack, you know this too, fine dining never makes any money. Um, all the way down to really the QSRs, the McDonald's and the Burger Kings and the pizza places, you know, all hail pizza and wings, they make money because they can do volume. But they also had delivery nailed and they did a lot of the delivery themselves. So pre-COVID, what we had was many restaurants who were moving into delivery because they had to, because the consumer said, okay, we get it now. We don't care. We want it delivered to, to our place. And restaurants had to foot the bill. So they were already teetering on in not being profitable. Mm -hmm. COVID hits. Now it's, you're completely dependent on delivery. And if you are not a restaurant that had cash flow or had, had runway on cash, you were forced to close. Many mid-tier restaurants also forced to close because they could not implement the technology in time to be able to meet the delivery need or the curbside need or, you know, the, 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 we call it off-premise dining. So take out, uh, whether you have it delivered, whether you pick it up, um, whether you do it through an app, whether you do it through a third-party delivery service, it's all called off-premise. Off-premise was already starting to have a hockey stick line pre-COVID. And so it's thrown many restaurants into one having to catch up on technology and the restaurant industry typically has been very slow. It's not the most modern group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so they really had their, their feet, I call it in technology cement. 
And now they've, the, the good ones have, have said, listen, it's time we have to embrace this technology. So I think what we're going to see is even more technology happen. I think that, that menus are being simplified, um, trying to figure out how to get more efficiencies in back of house, more local sourcing so it's not coming from the other side of the planet. Um, the, you know, the, the whole idea of ghost kitchens, I don't, I don't know, Jack, if you know about ghost kitchens or have, have done much, much studying about it, but ghost kitchens are in, in strip centers, in industrial centers, and when you order on DoorDash, you order from Wings and Beer. And you think Wings and Beer is a restaurant with 15 different kinds of wings and all this different right. kinds of beer and you order it because it looks great. And maybe it's being um, promoted on um, Postmates or wherever. And it's coming from a small shop that has no, no storefront that's basically just a kitchen. It's a ghost kitchen. And in that ghost kitchen are all the meals for Wings and Beer, for burgers and shakes, for you know, 50 different restaurant concepts that were made up by somebody creative who said, okay, this sounds good and this has got a good logo and this is what the menu is going to be. And it's all made in the same kitchen. The consumer never knows that it's not a restaurant. Oh. And what's happening is that that model, which has been super successful, now you've got larger, larger restaurants that are saying, hey, why don't we do that? Why do we have to do this all through our restaurant with our back of house trying to figure out delivery, trying to figure out in restaurant sales, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what works on a patio? Why don't we just do that off premise? And so there's definitely a move and definitely interest and investment coming behind ghost kitchens. But I think the technology side of the business is really what we're going to see in the future, because I don't think, I think from safety, from a safety standpoint, um, you know, and also from a, just from a productivity standpoint, because restaurants are going to be serving less people in-house and serving more people out of house. Any of these restaurants that added family meals, they're not going to give up family meals when restaurants reopen because it's incremental to them and it's better margin. It is much better margin to, to take and say, we have to prepare 50 family meals of salmon buy the salmon, roast the salmon, get it all done and not have any customer interaction other than a phone call or a web order. Um, it's a much easier and more profitable model for them. So I think we're gonna see, and I think it's good for us because as consumers we're used to these choices, um, but I think we're going to see this technology piece of it and all these additive items that have happened um, you know, since COVID continue. It'll be interesting to see whether or not um, states still allow alcohol to be delivered. Because mm -hmm. that's been one of the, you know, you can call your favorite bar and right. get alcohol delivered and right. you get bartender drinks and it's not that much more expensive. So um, that's what I see happening. And that's that when I hear the talks behind the scenes and when I'm in board meetings and we're talking about where do we invest at this point in time, all the forward looking strategy is toward um, more localization and a better use of technology. That's a, you know, uh, uh, one of the chestnuts in journalism, my, my trade, is, the, is the, the, the sort of biannual story about food waste and, and how much is, you know, wasted. And I wonder if all this uh, with ghost kitchens and uh, family planning, pre-planning, I wonder, uh, is there any sense that we've gotten somewhat better in, in part because we're, we're all acting more efficiently about how we eat? There, there's a couple of reasons for that. The, the, the knowing when something is ordered ahead of time, if you've got yeah. orders that are put right. in, absolutely helps, helps waste because you're, you're, you're procuring the right amount of ingredients. There is new technology and lots of investment in new technology to be able to take that inventory mm -hmm. out of the hands, the manual hands, and put it, put it into a technical solution that allows waste to be very, very close to zero. Um, so you know, you're absolutely right, Jack. It mm. is it, 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 the, the zero waste concept of how do you get food costs to be even sharper than they already are is absolutely in play. Mm. Um, so one of the things that also comes to my mind as I hear you talk about these trends, Betsy, is the sort of decoupling of restaurant with a sense of place, right? That sense of place of being in a particular space while you're experiencing this restaurant, it, it seems like that's being reduced somehow. Is that 
uh, is that going to change the culture of food and of the sort of public space in which food is consumed? And, and Jack, this kind of, I want to kind of move this back to you because I think you've said something like, you know, whatever is being born right now in food culture, it comes with a history. And that history does have very much to do with place and the collecting of people into a place, right? I mean, well, let's, I think we... it's, it's important to add to this. We've been talking about the pandemic, but there's two major forces discombobulating a sort of the systems of society right now. The pandemic is one, but the other is the ongoing and unending protests that are happening in every major city every day. Uh, and, you know, they have not stopped. That, that, that is what is sort of alarming the politicians, is that the, the, the BLM protests are ongoing every night. Um, it's surprising everyone. I mean, one of the reasons why Taco Bell and McDonald's have issued pro-BLM statements and, and all these other restaurants have done that, Jamba Juice and everybody else, is because those people are out there. Uh, you know, and, and, and they are interacting with these restaurants, right, on a regular basis. Um, and in some ways, you know, I think the, 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 a, a sideshow of, of the protests is learning how to, A, be outdoors and also how to eat out of doors. Uh, my daughter was involved in a bunch of them in New York and ended up being on like the cooking squad of, of one of these uh, protests because they were outside all day long. So food became a key part of, you know, uh, of, of, of maintaining the protests, right? Um, and I guess, uh, you know, historically, it's, it's, it's worth saying that that has always been the case. Food and, and public protests, freedom of assembly go hand in hand. So, you know, it's not a coincidence that what made one of the places where the civil rights movement in the 60s became famous was the lunch counter at Woolworths, right? That's when, you know, many Americans woke up to the fact that this ongoing long civil rights movement was becoming this much more public place. Um, and, uh, you know, you can look at almost any of these, uh, uh, you know, these movements in the past and, and, and connect it to food. I, I was just going through a couple, you know, um, the free speech movement in Berkeley, there were a number of people making, you know, uh, all kinds of protests every day. And the girlfriend of one of those people was, was occasionally cooking food and she eventually opened a restaurant, Chez Panisse, you know, um, <laughs> right. And um, uh, in, in the South, in Alabama, there's a very famous uh, woman who was involved with Martin Luther King, Georgia Gilmore who started, her cooking was just so good, everybody came by her place to sort of like meet and greet, you know, and like organize and plan and all that kind of stuff. But then she started selling her food and getting other friends of hers to cook, um, you know, and sell their pies uh, publicly as a way to raise funds. And it was a clandestine way because of course, you know, women's work, the domestic sphere, the kitchen, these are unseen places of, of, of profitability, right? So, and, and it was also a way for like white people to, to provide funds to the civil rights movement at a time when that was very difficult, as you could go by Georgia Gilmore's house and buy a pie. Um, it was also a way to even extract funds from the racists. You know, the pies got sold to the diners and, you know, the white ladies at the counter sold them and that money went back to Georgia. You know, by the end, that was such an important place of fundraising. Uh, uh, Georgia Gilmore's kitchen and all the other, uh, you know, uh, accompanying kitchens that I think Lyndon Johnson came by her house and ate lunch, you know, sort of somewhere in his presidency. Um, so, you know, food was like, I mean, hand in glove with, with protest movements. And, and that reshaped the way we ate, you know. A lot of the foods that we still, that, that are famous now, and a lot of the ways we eat are, date back to some of these movements because that was, there was a kind of a discombobulation of society and a reorganization of how we interacted. And food is always at the center of any interaction among humans, right? I, I, I gotta say, I just love listening to Jack. Every time he talks, I, I, I learn something new. It's just <laughs> totally amazing. I think you should do this weekly. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> Sorry, I need, to, I need I to add one more. I need to add one more to this because it's because we, we live with it every day and, and it's absolutely invisible. Um, but, you know, 
the Black Panthers are most famous for standing up with berets on and guns because that's the way J. Edgar Hoover wanted us to see them. But one of their key programs was to make breakfast for you know, poor children. And, and they did that. That was their program, right? So they gave, and these were to ch children who didn't even know what breakfast was because they went to school hungry. Um, and that was their radical program. The FBI busted up those kitchens they raided those kitchens. They, uh, there's accounts of them like spitting in the food and urinating in the food. There's accounts of like children being terrorized by cops coming in because they were eating breakfast. All right. Now, once all that, once the smoke cleared and the Black Panthers were, you know, history, uh, the United States Congress in 1975, you know, passed the breakfast program. The reason every student in America has access to a free breakfast in this country in many places is because of the Black Panthers, right? So even in that protest movement, that was their, that was one of their big, you know, contributions uh, in, in that movement, besides all the guns and all the rest of the stuff that, like I said, the FBI really wanted us to see, right, was, was food, right? The, 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 the phrase soul food came out of that movement. That's why that's, it was literally about saving your soul. Um, and, and, and that language and many of those recipes and, and the foods that we eat today date back to that time. So it'll be really interesting to see what comes out of this. Uh, population and reorganization of how we eat. So it's not just systemic racism that's going down. <laughs> There's some systemic eating that's going down too. <laughs> Um, all right. So uh, any, any thoughts, Betsy, of, as you hear that kind of historical view um, and even what's happening right now with protest movements, any thoughts about how the restaurant industry may be responding to Black Lives Matter or other social justice movements that are happening right now? Well, you know, I think restaurants are trying to survive themselves. And most of them are just trying to figure out how to how to keep their doors open or the light, not even the doors open, their lights on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, of course, every business in America, and restaurants included, is talking about how do we be more supportive and how do we how do we look at all of our systems and processes and how do we look at our menu? And, and I'm on a, a board that you didn't mention called Lazy Dog Cafe, which is amazing. It's a it's like a cheesecake factory, but it's all scratch cooking from a, from a chef family. And they have 38 locations and, um, and a clientele that is very, very white um, by nature of they were born in Wyoming. So, you know, if you can picture Wyoming. And so this, this concept has moved out. They have spent an extraordinary amount of time in the last five months looking at where are our future locations going to be? Why can't this be available to all areas of the country? It is not an expensive restaurant. Um, it is great value. It is great for groups. There's an outside patio. You can bring your dog. It's got so many things that, that are so great for all uh, you know, parts of the country and for all socioeconomic status levels. And so I, I um, it's been really remarkable to see how they're actually thinking about how they're designing systems to be less exclusionary. And of course there's been help. It had to get help because we look at everything through our own white filter. And so they have <clears throat> really spent the money and are doing the work to figure out how to, how to make this work for everyone. Um, but I, I, I was going to go back and say that you know, while many, many restaurants are closing, a good majority are going to close of the mom and pops, um, you know, those that come out of the other end, I mean, what we saw when we had that brief moment where restaurants opened up again, we saw the consumer flock to rest. Restaurants were packed. Bars were packed. I mean, food, how we eat, where we eat, what we eat is all, it is a significant factor in our lives. And I agree completely with Jack that, that this is, you know, it's, it's a part of who we are, how we interact with each other. And so we were concerned when restaurants open up again, even though there's fear, will the consumer respond or is the consumer's habits after, you know, so many weeks changed and restaurants are not going to be at the top of their list anymore. And it, it didn't matter if you were young, middle-aged or old, 
you are out in restaurants and bars, except for me, um, because because of the social factor. And and in the in the month that they were actually three weeks, they were able to open. We saw many restaurants do better business than last year mm. because when people came back to restaurants, they're very loyal. They were making that choice to go to that restaurant. And that's going to be the big difference is there's going to be winners and losers when restaurants open up again, because you want the place where you feel safe. You want a place that feels clean. You don't want to go in and have a crappy meal like you had, Jack. You want to go in and have a good meal. You, you're going to go out once a week. You want a good meal. And so those restaurants that are able to meet that expectation, I think are going to be winners. But we saw, I mean, it was amazing to see these restaurants rebound over a three week period to numbers that we've never seen before. Part of it was because I think of the spike of coming back, but you also layer on the continued family meals, the continued cocktails to go, the continued delivery. And it's a much smarter model. Uh, so it is, as painful as all of this is, I think when we emerge from this, we're going to have a healthier restaurant industry. Right. Well, it'll certainly be really different. I mean, you know, the, I mean, the science is in that if you're outdoors, it's much, much safer than if you're indoors, right? And a lot of these spikes in the southern states have been in bars and places where people are shouting and screaming and they're drunk. And so that's, that is the most dangerous way to socially interact, right? Sitting outside, maybe a little breeze and, you know, the, the, the chances of contracting, um, uh, you know, COVID under the the circumstances are vanishingly small. You have places like New Haven, where uh, I live, um, you know, the mayor has basically uh, taken over uh, half the street and allowed restaurants to extend their seating all the way out into the middle of the road, right, so that you can get that kind of space. I don't know how much further that's going to be adapted, but like I said, I think we kind of have to go to this more casual way of eating, sitting outside or in these really spacious ways, or it's like it's like it's all beach food. Um, or, um, you know, I see that the, in Manhattan, for instance, there's the, the, the rents on a lot of these ground floor restaurants have been kind of suspended until uh, I think se September 1st is going to be a really terrible deadline for a lot of restaurants because um, they're going to that moratorium will end and then you're going to see a crash in, re in commercial real estate, specifically restaurant real estate. But then what will come out of that is that, you know, those landlords got to rent to somebody. And someone's going to come up with different ways to inhabit those spaces or use those spaces. Maybe it's all going to be ghost kitchens. I don't know, but but we're going to see. I mean, we're we're seeing right this this uh, massive reorganization. Um, but we will figure out a way to to eat uh, in public because <laughs> it's it's what we do. But Jack, as as they say, Jack, um, on, on one of our favorite programs winter is coming yeah. <laughs> well that's so true when winter comes uh at least in some mm -hmm. parts of the country yeah. what happens to the restaurant industry well that was some always strategy through even before the COVID, right i mean winter was always a terrible time for restaurants even even before COVID. so i mean maybe there'll be a better takeout system by then maybe the technology will catch up and we'll have a way in which to do this in a in a much friendlier way. There are also all sorts of other, there's a lot of science behind how to sit indoors, you know, if there's fans, if there's higher humidity, even in the cold or the warm, that crashes the COVID uh, virus when it's suspended in the air. I mean, I, I mean, I wish we had like a Manhattan project by our federal government to figure out how this should be happening. That's what any country would do prior to right now. Um, but, and maybe we'll just, you know, do this by, you know, with shoestring and gum. We're going to figure this out. Um, unfortunately, it won't be, uh, you know, the great minds of the federal government helping us, but, but we will figure this out. I mean, already some restaurants, like Betsy was saying, have not only made it through these early months of COVID, but have, have actually thrived. So there are, there are paths out. Well, and restaurant design companies understand that. I'm looking at restaurant designs now where there are garage doors that completely open up and over the bar. Mm -hmm. so, that, so the bar is basically outside. Um, right. Uh, more restaurants are, are allocating more space to patios. And, and it's actually healthier to eat outside anyway. I mean, forget COVID. I mean, it's nicer to be in the fresh air if you have the fresh air. But I will also say there are a lot, from a technology standpoint, 
you know, a lot of things that we're seeing for restaurants that are located in areas where there is cold or heat in the summertime mm -hmm. are temperature controls that can be outside that can actually make a pocket of an mm -hmm. area mm -hmm. uh, be warmer, be cooler, be, be less humid. Uh, be more human, whatever it is that you want. And so um, all of a sudden, these sort of um, bills that for restaurants who are remodeling or restaurants who are taking over another space or restaurants that are doing expansions are spending more time thinking about what if we can only serve outside? How do we protect a good portion of our business? And that's never been the way the restaurant industry has thought before. So it's actually you know quite refreshing to have this, you know, people spending time talking about what does the future hold? Right. I mean, I, I'll compare it to journalism. You know, the, the New York Times, for the, where I've worked for, you know, two decades, has spent that much time trying to figure out what to do about their print edition and their digital edition. <laughs> and they finally married the two and made both of them uh, profit centers. But it took a long time oh, sure. to figure out how to make that work. I suppose delivery and sort of sitting in some kind of structured uh, sense of place will will those two you know, zones will be, with luck, profit centers for restaurants in the future. Right now, neither one of them seems to be, but, but somehow we will work that out. And maybe it's, it's gonna be that balance between maybe in winter, a lot more takeout, and summer, a lot more sitting around, you know? Um, at least for now, that's what it looks like. So a, a question's come in that kind of, um, it loops us back to the sort of equity questions that we were talking about earlier and, and really focuses on some of the restaurant workers, perhaps the lowest wage restaurant workers, and what seems to be happening with that? And as the restaurant industry starts to rebound from this in whatever way it does, whether it's ghost kitchens or different forms of restaurants, or more, um, how do we align this in a way that, that also protects the, the lowest paid workers? Wow, you know, especially at a time of diminishing uh, revenue and profit. Yeah, Betsy, I'm going to throw that one to you. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it, this has been really tough. And with the minimum wage increases and, um, I mean, the protection of the back of house workers has really been left up to the whoever the proprietor is, whoever the restaurant owner is or the restaurant company is. You know, I think one of the big movements that's happening that I think will come out of COVID, and I think there's some great silver linings out of COVID, but I think one of them is going to be fi the final abolishment of the tip system. Mm. And because the tip system is very much, it's, it's, it's an arcane system. It is very much about the front of house, not the back of house. The back of house actually works harder than the front of the house. The front of house just has the smile. And the idea that tips Ooh, should be... I know, I know they are. I know they are, but you know, if you go- That's someone who worked in both. Uh, yes, you know. oh, I know, I know. Um, but you know, it is interesting, and I always say this, if you go to a place and the food is great and the service is terrible, you might go back. If you go to a place where the food is terrible and the service is good, you don't go back because you don't want bad food. So you'll give somebody else a chance in the front of house and very rarely will you give That's somebody true. a chance in the back of house. And I think that, you know, if, if wages, there will be a big shift in wages if there is a way to fairly administer tips. Because, because when you look at the money that is brought in on tips, if it was spread evenly based on the work that was done, there would not be this issue of service workers making so much less um, than front of house workers. And I'm mm -hmm. sure it's probably, a, you know, it's a, it's a controversial topic for anybody who works in the front of house, but if you just pull yourself back and, and recognize it, um, who, who has the risk? Now, COVID is also making it a little riskier to work in front of house. So I think, you know, we'll have to really look at that. But, um, but I think that the, the, the service piece of it, and with so many immigrants who are working, and I mean, the restaurant business really has been shaken. It last three and a half years, the restaurant business has really been hit by, do we don't have enough people to work. Uh, it's very difficult if you're a high growth company and expanding and you're opening restaurants and you need to hire, you know, X hundred number of, of, mm -hmm. of back of house workers. Um, it's, it's really difficult to do. And the minimum wage issue or the, has also put pressure. So 
Um, that's why I'm saying the restaurant model has not been profitable and it almost needs a shakeup across the board to emerge from this in a healthier way. Um, thank you. That, 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 was, that was a great answer that, um, and to a really great question. And I cannot believe it, but it is one o'clock already. Uh, this conversation has uh, ranged widely. It's, 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 it's taken some deep dives as well. And I am so grateful to you, Betsy, and to Jack for joining us for this. Thank you to the folks who tuned in and sent us these thoughtful questions. And I hope you'll continue to, to tune in for the additional uh, webinars and conversations we'll be having as part of this series at Quinnipiac called The Way Forward. And um, until then, we wish you all well and stay self safe, stay safe and stay healthy. Great Thank talking you. to Betsy. Bye -bye. Thank you, Jennifer. Fantastic. Thanks, Jeff.